Hey everybody, I'm Nate Moore. I'm a member of the Melco Applications team. I am here with Scott Stingle, who is not mic'd, so he'll have to yell to say hi. Hello, everybody. Um, I broke his mic last week, sorry. And uh, I'm here with Mike Doe as well. And I think he is mic'd, and I think he is coming over. <laughs> Just making sure I don't trip all over these cables that, uh, boy, it's shiny off the top of my head. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Some top of my head is a little shiny today. We've got new lights in here. So um, good morning. Um, thank you for joining us on another Facebook Live. We've got some really good stuff with uh, Nate and the crew here about uh, thread path and troubleshooting that. But I also want to tell you to um, hang around, uh, switch over to YouTube, Melko's YouTube channel. We have a premiere of a really cool video that... Um, the marketing department here at Melco and a lot of uh, employees at Melco have been a part of. Um, so we want you to check out that premiere. So as soon as uh, Nate is done uh, feeding us with a whole bunch of great information, kick it over to YouTube and check out that premiere video. So no further ado, I will <laughs> hand it back to Mr. Moore. So like Mike said, we will be looking at um, troubleshooting thread breaks and, and how to deal with that. And I will be focusing mostly on the thread path and what goes through my mind as I get a thread break other than, you know, expletives. <laughs> um, so uh, to start, um, in your manual on uh, the OS, you do have some thread break troubleshooting and it will walk you through a decision table, uh, if you will, of how to make uh, those choices as to where do I even start looking. Um, so can we swap sure. to the screen? So all I did um, in the advanced interface, just go to help or click on the uh, question mark, and it's going to launch this. And I'm going to scroll down through. I could find it by uh, troubleshooting. Control F is a good way to do that. Um, but it's one of the very last things. So I'm just going to scroll to the bottom of the uh, table of contents. And then thread break troubleshooting is where I'm looking and diagnosing a thread break. And the table is what I was referring to. And this is going to start walking you through. Um, that's really zoomed out for you guys. Let's try to bring that in a little bit. Um, and the, the questions will start out, is it real or is it false? Is it top or is it bottom? And then it gets more specific from there. And then on the right side are possible things that you'll need to look for. So is it real? Um, thread breaks on this material only, then we need to look at these things. Or if the thread breaks are on all materials and garments, then ask more questions and then try these solutions. So Nate, if I could back up one second, tell me where I find this troubleshooting guide again, please. So it is in uh, the OS, it's in uh, the operator's manual, or uh, I suppose we could go to Melco Service. If I could, no, I want the address bar. <laughs> Melco Service .com. And then um, I would go to either your machine, um, and then it's going to be in the advanced. And this would be in the Bravo OS manual as well? I think so. OK. That's a good question. Let's just double check that. Sometimes I lie, but I don't think I am. Not on purpose, Morton. No, <laughs> not usually. I mean, you're not practicing to be a politician, I don't think. So. Oh. Ouch. Wow. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. So yeah, I just <laughs> control F trouble and as cool. opposed to finding Mike Doe's so picture. So Bravo and EMT-16 were good. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so to start, uh, what I typically do when I get a thread break, um, you can just go to the main. Main one? Um, is I will look at uh, the overall thread path. And the first thread break, I'll probably just rethread and hit go. The second one, that's when I start to get a little more irritated and start to look a little more in depth at what's going on. Now, as I pull thread, um, I will tend to feel as the thread's pulling through to see if anything's happening up here. 
So things that can happen up here. Um, thread can get caught underneath this cone or this, the bottom of this and catch and pull. Also, uh, if you are rough with your cones, um, sometimes you can get a nick up here that it can grab onto. So you may want to take like a little bit of fine sandpaper and sand that off if that's the case or just be nicer with your cones. Um, other things that I've noticed, uh, this machine came from somewhere else in the building and some people will take uh, needles and stick them into the foam to hold on to them, to hold on to bobbins, to hold on to whatever. Um, and in certain places, that's probably okay. This one is a bit of a problem in that as this cast, casts off, it can actually get caught. Now, I feel like I should have staged this, but I didn't. This was one that I actually found this way. This one, you'd probably be okay. Um, if you're using small cones, you may find that it catches underneath as well. That's what these little coasters are for, is to keep it pooling down here as opposed to underneath. Um, so if it's spinning and things like that, you need to look at alternative solutions and get your little coasters up there to keep that. Um, making sure that these are sticking up above will help prevent rubbing and pulling as it comes off of there. So I'm looking at all of that as I'm pulling the thread through. Other things um, that I will look at, watch here as I pull through and I'm going to lift this pin troller and I'm going to make sure, I'm going to lift a pin troller you can see, there we go, well, nope, I'm going to lift a color that you can see, there we go. <laughs> And now I'm going to make sure that that thread is actually lined up on um, that little notch inside of there. The other thing, if you are finding that your thread is walking out to the side, so you're sewing along, you get a, you get a thread break and you look and it's not really broken here, um, don't be so quick to go ahead and press the green button because if it's walked out to the side or if you have left this up, Mm. Um, you can get a bird's nest, so that's, that's not so great. You'll want to be very careful with that. Cut that out. Don't just pull. Um, yeah, but one of the, if, I could, if I could stop you right there, any time that I lift that pin troller up, I'll keep my, I guess, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually ambidextrous, so it's kind of hard, but my less dominant hand is my left hand. I'll keep that, my fingers on there. Um, pull the thread through and then close it so I never take my hand off. I, I typically do too, unless I'm doing maintenance or something like that. Yeah. Um, which is a bit trickier. But that's uh, like the number one thing that I see out in the field is people will lift that up, they'll get go it all. Do this number, it's a two hand yeah. pull. Nah. Someone will walk in the door, ask about their order, and then they just press start and they get a bird's nest, <laughs> right? So we've been there, all done that, I'm sure. So. Um, you can fix it next I, week. I Next don't, week, we're talking about bird's nest. Yeah. This is, yes. I don't do that quite as often anymore. Well, you're smart. So I, I, nah, I'm nah. not. It's okay. The one that I do most frequently, Yeah. I, uh, I leave the bobbin out right oh. here on the table. Put it on there, press go, and snap really hard. Mm. So make sure the bobbin's in there when you start. Okay. Um, but back don't to this. Look bad then. <laughs> uh, make sure that it's rolling really well. If it's not... What you may need to do is go ahead and do the, the maintenance on this where you're taking this guy off, uh, greasing uh, the three little, there's three little feet on the inside of there. You want to grease the outside of those three little feet so that it rolls nice and smooth um, and you don't get resistance so that the thread has a nice easy path to follow. And is that the white grease or the red grease on that? So it, <laughs> <laughs> well, right now, but there are people out there that still have white lithium grease, so I can't say yes, it's the white grease. It's the EMB polymer grease because it's, it's the going polymer on the grease. Um, or if you have two colors of grease, it's the white grease. If you have both colors, both greases are the same. Look for that polymer. Polymer meaning plastic composite. The pinch rollers. That's how I always think of it. So. Yeah, and I, I, I'm relatively sure the red wouldn't hurt, except that it's red. Yeah. So that could do some stainingness if something gets onto well, just something else. What I've been, I asked this question and it Did just, you? Yeah, it just doesn't lubricate well. So it usually just pushes out and it doesn't. Um, oh, it doesn't, in this specific application. Yeah, it doesn't do any damage um, other than it might cause damage to the garment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it just doesn't do the lubrication that it should. Where this is. That makes sense. All right. So I've got this in place here. Um, other things that I will look. Um, Scott, if we can pan down just a touch. 
without making everybody car sick. Nice. Yeah. So I'll make sure that it is through all of the holes that it needs to be. So I'm actually going to unthread this. Is this a good color or should I do the, let's do the yellow. Yellow yeah, is a little bit yellow better. Yellow is much better. Okay. So I can't believe I just unthreaded that, but I did. So I typically, again, like Mike, will leave my hand on this, line it up, pull it down. I tend to, and I don't know about you guys, but I tend to leave it down so that I also have it something to pull against so I can see the line be straight. Yeah. Um, That's, I didn't know that. That's a good point. Yeah. You then go down through the top of the upper thread guide. Try to stay out of the camera's way. And then down through one of the two back pieces, and it's the one that makes the bend in the L on the middle thread guide. And the trick, there's two tricks here, especially if I'm threading from the side. Um, don't get it back behind the cover, but you have to make sure that it goes under this bar. Can you scroll down just, or uh, scroll, pan down just a touch? There you go. It's going to go under this bar, and that bar is your thread sensor. If it's not under there, and I, I have seen people do it where they come out to the front of that bar and then just go straight up through, so it's only looped around this piece of metal that you totally can't see, this piece of metal, um, well, then the thread sensor can't feel it, and it doesn't think it's really there. So then I'm going to go back up through the front. So now that loop is looping around that bar thread sensor. I'm going to go through the take-up lever from the right to the left, and then I'm going to go back down through the last one, which is at the end of the leg of the L, or I guess since it's upside down, it would be, is that a seven? Sure. Um, this is going to be a little bit different depending on your machine. Um, these are on newer machines. I have had some people try to put this in here now. I struggle with that. I don't worry about it until I'm through the lower thread guide. Yep. Um, so go ahead, Scott. Down a, little bit. Down a little bit more. Keep going, keep going. There we go. That's perfect. Nice All job, right. Scott. And so I will go down through the lower thread guide. This one's important. Um, I know a lot of people, uh, when I was teaching class, they'd, they'd go through, they'd get really, really excited, and they'd be like all this way down, and then they'd just go straight through the eye of the needle and miss this one. Uh, that, that doesn't help. Um, with starting very much, so go ahead and get it through there. And then once I'm through this, I'll go ahead and pull tight and push that into that felt if you have it. If you don't, don't stress about it. That's then, also another way to double check that you close the pin troller because if you <laughs> if I pull on it and it goes, if you pull down and it doesn't go in the dampener, then you know the the pin troller's still up. So. That's true. And then through the eye of the needle, and at this point, I will do a visual inspection of needle orientation. Um, if if, not my machine, if, uh, if I think it looks a little bit off, I will go ahead and close that grabber and use a needle orientation magnet and see does that look right. And that looks pretty good to me. Looks um, pretty good. And, and I mean, because we're talking about this, um, should the needle be uh, rotated to the left slightly straight or to the right slightly? So uh, we do have uh, a whole video on needles um, and orientation and all of that. But ideally, um, you want the eye of the needle five degrees to the right. So you want it um, pretty much straight out from the machine and just enough to the right to know that it's not to the left. Got it. And that, that affects, let me trim this up, um, that affects how the loop of thread is formed at the back of the needle. So if you rotate the wrong direction, you're actually going to be snapping your thread or not picking up. Um, so yeah, needle orientation is pretty important. Um, while I'm down here, I'll also go ahead and check um, to make sure that my bobbin is rotating the right direction, um, is actually in there, because <laughs> some people leave it out occasionally. Just saying, that's an ugly, ugly sound. So that snap. Yes. Um, yeah, that gets a nice rattly sound. Until it turns and then, yeah. <laughs> um, so that is the, the basic, uh, what I do is I come through here, top, down, um, double checking everything. And again, I don't do that every time. Um, I will check, because I'm pulling thread through the needle, I will check and see if I feel anything funky, see if I feel anything that's catching or, 
feels odd. Um, but for the first time, I'll do that, and then I'll just visually inspect the needle as I'm threading it, because I'm right there, I'm looking right there. Um, second time, I'll go ahead and check some of this other stuff. Um, it also kind of depends on how far up it broke, whether I'm going to check it there or not. Uh, but um, that thread path, upper and dealing with the lower, uh, is definitely some important stuff as I troubleshoot my thread breaks. And I'm going to jump in too. Um, so this is the, uh, the chance for us to give you a really cool option of rather than lifting the, the pin troller arm up, um, more times than not, the, the needle that we're dealing with to re-thread is the active needle. And how we can tell the active needle is it's the one that has the presser put behind it or the one that we're actually sewing with. And so what you can do on the keyboard, and maybe Nate can be my Vanna White on this, <laughs> you can push the laser button and the up arrow, and that will, um, if we could pan back up to the pinch rollers, and I'll, I'll cruise back over here and change our view. Um, if you see the active needle, or active, which needle is active right now? That's a good question. Nine? Nine. Aww. So if you watch... <laughs> And yeah, you can watch all you want. It's not going to do anything. Oh. Why isn't it going to do anything? You can see it spin. Maybe you can see it spin. And unfortunately, it's on black, so you can't see why it's not doing anything. It's not lined up. Ah, so, but um, a, a nice way to do that is actually using that laser and the up arrow. So we're going to just try move it, over to let's red. Let's try it on yellow. Or yellow? Okay, so there now we go. See it <laughs> so what Nate is pushing on the keypad of the machine, I'm going to cruise back over to where you guys can see that uh, screen, is he's pushing the laser, looks like a pin, and then the up arrow, the one that push it, uh, uh, points up to the ceiling together, and that actually will feed thread out so you don't have to lift the pin troller up. The other nice thing about that, and I use this, I don't know if you guys do, but by using that, that tells me if the thread break happened because of what's called a cone break, like Nate was talking about, the thread gets underneath the cone, um, and that can be for a number of reasons. Um, maybe it's a, a, a weird shaped cone, or it's a small cone, and you don't have those, um, those Madeira uh, washer things, um, coaster things underneath it. Um, if you don't have those, those came in your starter kit with your machine, or they should have, but if you don't have them, I believe Madeira's got them on their website, and. Um, as Nate progresses on, I'll try to find the link to that and post it in the comments. But I would have, if you use any kind of small cones whatsoever, you should have at least a half dozen of those um, uh, laying around. I think you get 16 with the starter kit. Which is a lot. Yeah, it's, it, when you get them, you're like, dude, are these for like clay pigeons? <laughs> like going out and doing shotgun testing or something? But no, it's not. They're actually useful. Hopefully you didn't throw them away or you know, uh, something like that, because they are useful. So thank you, Madeira, for providing that for us. So. Um, All right, sorry, that was just no, a little short that's, little that's, hack for the laser up arrow. So. And that's, yeah, uh, I mean, it's for technicians to diagnose how much it feeds out and does it, is it exact and whatnot, but we can use it for feeding out thread when we want it. And you're right, it does check, is it caught here, is it... Um, and it's something you do frequently and I do almost never. It's so funny um, how different people Well, and that's the cool thing about our system is, is it's, it, it allows, like, you know, both you and I are, are creative minded, but you, you have an aspect of being more detailed and analytical also, <laughs> where I just stick in the creative realm all my life. Um, and so it allows you to think, you know, you, be, you may be the person that goes, Mike, I would never use the laser up arrow. Or you may be one of those people that go, you know what, I'm never touching the pinch roller arm again. If I don't have to, I'll just use the lasers. I, I never have to deal with the bird's nest. And once again, just a preview, next week, Chris Fenton will be talking about how to clear a bird's nest um, using some really cool nifty tools. So make sure you tune in next week. And then also one more plug. This Friday, every Friday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, um, we do a design shop talk. So if you haven't been tuning into that, it's your opportunity, no matter if you've been a 
Melco design shop or maybe EDS3 or EDS4 and now design shop. It allows you to come in and ask questions. You don't have to be a brand new user to ask these questions. You can be the oldest user that we've got um, and, and come in. It just has to be the latest software. We can't, we can't answer questions about DOS software anymore. I apologize for that. I wish we could, but we, uh, other than Scott, I was gonna, <laughs> other, other than Scott, uh, Nate and I were probably in elementary school when that software came. No, I'm wow. just kidding, Scott. So um, one other thing is, I see no questions from anybody. We've got tons of people logged in watching us right now, and nobody has any questions or comments. Nice. How, how is that possible? So get your questions and comments in so we can answer them. So, I mean, this was basically it for what I do troubleshooting thread breaks when I'm throwing up a machine. Um, other things that you may want to consider if it's something that is happening to you and it's this design, double check your tie stitches, make sure that you actually have them. Um, those are important. You'll get a lot of, well, misstarts rather than thread breaks um, from a lack of tie, but. Uh, or pullouts when you uh, end, because um, the thread will start feeding or pulling out when you, it's not tied into place. So make sure that you have your tie stitches. You have thoughts in your head. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, so if you check, if you're having thread breaks and you've checked your path and everything is good and you you place oh. your needle and you checked your bobbin tension and everything is working well, what you might do is you might have a, um, yeah, you could check the cone itself. Make sure that maybe the cone got dropped and it may have a bruise on it Remember or something? Remember when I said be nice to your cones? Yeah. Um, yeah, if you, if you drop your cones, if you're mean to your cones, the threads will shift and it'll cause them to cast off kind of funny. It feels, feels kind of like you're pulling across sandpaper is yeah. what it feels like to me when I'm pulling it through the needle. So if I have a, a bruised cone, it'll feel really good, really good, really good. Suddenly it feels like I'm pulling across sandpaper and then I'll do it again. And it'll be nice when it's on whatever side of the cone and then it'll get to the bruise and it'll pull kind of hard. So. That's a bruised cone. That's not going to go away. Sometimes you can cast off a ton of it and get past it. Um, Sometimes the times it's, it's you just may worth just getting rid of it. Yeah, toss as the hard cone as that go. is. But the other thing is, is I would have a go-to design. So if, if you've checked everything, and, and, and we've seen people, and I, I've been one of them actually, that you get frustrated and you're like, dude, I've checked everything. <laughs> I, I, I was just sewing a design yesterday and it sewed great and I moved to a new order today and all I'm getting is thread breaks. Like Nate said, it, it may be design related. So to check, you know, if it's a machine thing, have a go-to design that you can throw some scrap material in, sew it, see if you've got everything in check and if so, then you can go, ah, there's something in this design that's causing me some heartache and I can either if I'm the digitizer I can go in and, and modify it and fix it because we all make mistakes right um, or I can send it back to my digitizer um, and say hey I, I love you to death Mr. Digitizer or Mrs. Digitizer but something is wrong in this design <laughs> um, and I'm getting a lot of thread breaks and and that's... don't be afraid of doing that because if you if you don't, you're gonna you're gonna make yourself go crazy. And I'm in the loony bin already, so you don't want to join me. I uh, because I'm because I've been doing it so long. Um, I typically will not jump to the designs the problem first. Um, that's usually later for me. I will, this is where I will check first. Um, then I'll check applications. Am I is you know didn't. This is still thread path. Is my needle bird? Is is my presser foot up? Yeah, <laughs> that's not one that I remember to do very often. But it is one that will bite me if I was doing 3D foam or something thick and I wasn't paying attention. And or, as is the case here most frequently, I will go steal somebody else's machine and I have no idea what they were doing last, and I don't check it because on my machine, I know what I did last, and so it's just. I, I don't worry about it, and then I go grab another machine, and oh, it's up, and that causes me all kinds of problems. You know, one question that pops up to my mind, and people are not asking questions, so I will ask questions <laughs> for them. Great. Um, is the bobbin case? Um, so more times than not, after I've oh. checked all of that, talk to me about the bobbin case, and and what do I need to look at in troubleshooting thread path when it comes to the bobbin case? So I, I mean, I just pulled this out of here, but uh, a few things. 
and a very embarrassing story comes to mind. <laughs> um, make sure that your bobbin is flowing well as it's casting off. It feels nice. It's not, you're not catching. You're not, every now and then you'll find a bobbin that is either overwound, and so it's a little bit thicker, um, so as you pull it'll feel way tighter than normal. And those are kind of nice because you can just cast them off in your hand and still use them, which is great. Um, other things, try really hard not to drop these because if you bend it out of round, if you bend the case out of round, it, it's not going to work. <laughs> so um, maybe have an extra uh, case that you can swap out, see if that's going on. Clean your case. Go ahead and uh, clean that case and tension it appropriately. Um, as you're sewing, lint can build up under this spring, and uh, you might have been adjusting with the lint in there, and then if the lint goes away, the spring will snap down on your thread, and that makes it really hard to pull. It won't pick up. Um, make sure it's in the right way. As it's in the machine, if you pull on the thread, it should rotate counterclockwise as you're looking at it. Um, the one that's very embarrassing for me, I, uh, it was early on when I was here and I was teaching a class and I had a bobbin. I tested it in my hand. It was great. I put it into the machine and I hit go and it would not pick up. I could not make this machine pick up thread. Oh no. And I'm in front of the class and I, no, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Scott asked, was the needle backwards, which is another thing that I, embarrassing story, it took me 45 minutes to figure out somebody had it in backwards. I was on the phone, I couldn't see it in my defense. Um, but no, for the one that would not pick up, it was overwound. But it was overwound, not that it got bigger around, but that it got wider. Oh. Which I, I've only seen two of in doing this. Um, so I test it in my hand, everything felt great. I put it in the machine, I didn't pull any more off when it was in the machine, I just and put it in the machine. Well, it was so tight against the back, it was rubbing, it wouldn't rotate. It could not pull. So it could not pick up bobbin. And I actually had to call a tech. And uh, <laughs> the tech it gave me, rightfully so, no end of the grief. Um, also, but yeah. Oil Oh, so Scott, because he's not mic'd up, I don't know if you could hear him. He said, over oiling the bobbin, um, the, the cardboard, pardon me, over, don't oil the bobbin. Don't oil the bobbin. Don't oil the bobbin. Over oiling the hook uh, can have some of that bobbin, uh, the dang it, oil come up and swell the cardboard bobbins and cause them to get bigger, which could cause very similar issues to what I was saying. Uh, Scott just said the retaining finger, which I totally thought I, yes. Little bitty weird looking gauge, um, retaining finger gauge. Uh, and has Chris done one on setting the I retaining finger? I can't remember. I thought so. If he so. hasn't done one, we'll yeah. get him to do one. Yeah. Replace the hook. Yeah. So yes. Go back and watch Chris's uh, replacing the hook and he talks about how to set the retaining finger. It's a good thing to check. Um, but, but that's what this little piece is for. That's in your ops kit, that little uh, cardboard box that has all the extra goodies in it. That thing is in. Oh, They used to have the part number stamped in them, and I was trying to cheat, but it's not on here. Um, hey, Rob Wood throws out a, a good point. Um, he said, maybe mention uh, a little pull on the thread after threading will assist with uh, PR placement, so pinch roller placement, so that making sure that the thread is underneath it. If you pull the thread taut, um, if you still have the pinch roller up, will help keep it underneath the roller. Um, good idea, Rob. Thank you for throwing that yeah, out. Yeah, absolutely. Can, um, do we want to zoom in on that? Yeah. I, I think that's pretty good. Right there? Yeah. Okay. So notice that the yellow, I think you can notice, is off to the side a little bit. Um, as I pull that thread, it will start to straighten out, and I may have to, sorry, stick my finger on the top of the, there we go. It starts to straighten out. Um, and then the other thing, it can get caught. I don't know how to show you guys this. There's another little set, another little groove back beside, 
behind here. Yeah. Um, if it's stuck on one side or the other, you may have to assist it a little bit. But yeah, pulling that as you do it. Oh, that was a bruise. Hey, this phone's bruised. That's awesome. Um, I can't make it stick. Yeah, you know, there. that's the stinky thing about um, thread when it gets bruised. Un unlike eggs where, you know, a damaged egg, you can see a crack in it. Thread, you can't see it. You have to feel it. Yep. And if you feel that bruise, um, more times than not, it's going to cost you more. Can you swap to this one real quick? Yep. It'll cost you more to oh, you continuously it. fix thread breaks than it would be just to replace the Kona thread itself. So it's too light to see, but um, this is pulling and it pulls against the top of this and catches. Otherwise, it cats off pretty loosely. Yeah, I totally not, can't see it. Unfortunately. Oh, that stinks. But if you feel that, if you're pulling that thread and you feel it catch, um, that's, more than likely that, that's going to cause an issue while, while sewing. And once again, you know, you get maybe 10 or 15 extra thread breaks out of a cone. You have just paid for replacing that cone and, and all the you yeah, know, your the time, agitation. So. Your time is definitely worth something. Yep. Um, let's see, we have a couple others. Uh, uh, Cheryl asks, where do you get the coaster? Cheryl will post a link for that from Madeira um, after this is over. I'm not able to get to that right now. Um, let's see here. Tiffany writes, do you recommend magnetic bobbins? Um, she says she's sorry that she's late to the party. So <laughs> it's okay, Tiffany. Welcome to the party. Um, but yeah, mag magnetic bobbins, in my opinion, I'll let you guys voice in, but I have not had good luck with magnetic bobbins, not so much because of the magnetic, but because they're sideless. Um, and I've had the thread fall off the side. And because the mag magnet is keeping the tension that the thread brake sensor is sensing that the bob, there's no problem with the bobbin, but what's really happening is the bobbin is causing looping and it's missing stitches. So more than it is the magnet it has to do with the sideless uh, is my problem that i've had and i prefer to have sides on my bobbin now there are some magnetic bobbins that do have sides um, those to me pull they, they feel almost like this is going to sound silly um, in in some of the applications that i've used um, the the bobbin itself as it's casting off and, and pulling through the bobbin case almost feels like a bruised cone to me ah. because the magnet's gripping and then on the like but so I've, I've had some that yep. have been okay yep. in some applications and, and there's a lot of people that use them and have great success with them so by no means uh, take our word for it as you know as the law um, if you use magnetic bobbins or you want to try them you know give them a shot and you may find out that they're the best thing since sliced bread, right? Um, I think Glide works the best. Okay. Instead of coats, magnetic is what I've found. Hmm. Um, the one thing I like about those, correct me if I'm wrong, but the magnet's only on one side, so you can't put the bobbin in backwards. Yeah, it it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. Here's another good one is, um, uh, is from Hal. Hal writes, uh, what is the correct tension for the bobbin? I used the two inch drop, but it seems to be only an estimate. So um, yeah, Hal, uh, probably, you, uh, you want uh, you? Yeah. Okay, there's you. Um, Hal, probably the, the best thing to do, um, and I can't say that I, I live by this, but I, I, like, <laughs> I like to suggest, and Melko suggests using a bobbin tension gauge. Um, it can be the toe gauge or Melco has a version of that. It's still the Toa gauge. We just, it says Melco on it. Um, use that and, you know, we range, what is the recommended is, I think it's 180 to 220. Is that about right? I think that's, I think that's close. Yeah, it's um, in the manual. We know that. So. I, I tend to run a little bit on the looser side if I can, but if I can't and it's giving me problems, I tighten it up. Here's the problem. Um, yeah, I, I still do the drop test too. Um, this one's actually a touch loose, um, which could mean that it needs to be cleaned. It could be something propping it open. But uh, depending on if the bobbin's sideless, 
if it's plastic sided, if it's cardboard sided, if it's full, if it's closer to empty, they're all going to weigh a little bit different. So dropping it is going to be slightly inconsistent depending on all of those factors. Now you'll find that as you do it, you'll get used to it uh, and, and find something that works well for you. So you don't always have to go to that gauge, but when you are having issues, going to that gauge is a great way to double check yourself. Cool, and uh, someone that looks like maybe Dan or someone from the service group just posted the link to the uh, Bob Intention gauge on Shop Melco. Awesome. Um, Noida, uh, and I think I, Nida, I always mess up Nida. Noida, I want to call her Nadia, but it's not. So Nadia. No, the, the letters Noida, are in the wrong order. Noida, but I apologize. I'm I hopefully saying your name right. I've met you multiple times. She asked, what causes the machine uh, to not tie in after a thread break? Um, and I'll give this one a shot too. To, um, to not? Tie in Typically, if you have break. like a, a, a fairly wide column, oh. um, you may want to back up a little bit further than the machine does because that wide column, it's going to take it, you know, if the stitches are close, it locks in. That's why lock stitches are, are small stitches. So when the machine has a thread break, right, it doesn't automatically throw in its own lock stitch when that thread break happens. That doesn't happen. Um, so you may want to back up a little bit further in the design, maybe go about 10, 15 stitches back to let that, uh, that thread lock in um, by the time it's, it's to that point. The other thing that I will do to avoid that is I will pull off some in my hand and I will back up a little and then I will loosely hold that thread. I'm not going to hold it really tight. I will loosely hold that thread, and then as it's sewing, I will make sure that that thread goes under where it's sewing, oh, okay. so that you lock it in, and you're covering your own tail, covering your in own more tail. than one way. Wow. Okay. Um, and then I'll stop it, trim it up, and go. Um, can I do the snap thing? It depends on the size of the stitches and whatnot. But if I have a nice big wide satin stitch, which is oftentimes when that'll happen, if I do that, you can see right where I did it because it'll squish the thread or uh, fabric or it'll pull into the wrong spot and you'll have a, a stitch that's off. So another question, will incorrect active feed settings cause thread breaks? Oh wow. So that's a really good question. The question, I don't know if you could hear Scott, will, will incorrect active feed settings cause thread breaks? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so if you're not feeding enough thread and you're starving the system, absolutely you're going to start snapping thread. Um, if you're feeding too much, it will cause uh, looping or false breaks um, sometimes. Um, if your bob intention, which isn't active feed, but it's still feeding or allowing thread into the system is too tight, it's not going to pick up. Um, if it's too loose, it can cause active feed to, to, to misinterpret the thread feed and, and can cause you some issues too. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, also, uh, if you're ever in auto and you're using the maximum, which there's a, there's a lower limit and an upper limit, if the upper limit's really, really low, you can starve it and, and cause thread breaks that way too. Lots of ways you can cause thread breaks. Cool. How about a burr in the needle plate? Um, <coughs> yes, a burr anywhere in the thread path can cause that. So a burr on the back side of the retaining finger. So if you're not careful with that gauge and you're scraping up, Either side of that, that can cause thread breaks later. Um, yeah, a burr anywhere in the thread path will do it. If it's someplace that is, I got this, <laughs> wait. If it's someplace <laughs> that every needle passes through, then you'll get thread breaks on every needle. So um, if it doesn't matter what needle you're on, what design you're on, what fabric you're sewing on, if, if none of those matter, then it may be somewhere else in the thread path that every thread passes through. So I'm going to start looking at something down here. And typically, if that's the case, I'm going to look at um, the retaining finger, uh, just the gap first before I start looking for burrs. Yeah, so overall, I would say, you know, if you go through your thread path, um, you check your needle, you check your bobbin uh, tension, your bobbin thread path, um, your presser foot, your active feed settings, you're still having issues, I would highly suggest calling the Melco service team um, because you may have something, you may have that retainer finger, you may have a burr on something, 
you may have a thread feed gear that's cracked that's not feeding the correct amount of active feed or the amount of thread out for the active feed so i would highly suggest at that point um, you know check another design but if that's where you get to instead of getting you know a day and a half into trying to troubleshoot this give the service group a call and let them help you troubleshoot that now i i would still check some basic application stuff first um, if I'm sewing on a cap with a 65 needle and I've got really scratchy buckram in the back of it, I'm probably going to go to a larger size needle to alleviate thread breaks that way before I start looking at bigger chunks on my machine. Cool. Um, I got a uh, message here, a comment from sharp things. Brenda. Hey. Uh, Brenda says, I never mess with ActiFeed. When should I? Um, so, Brenda, I would say um, you watch some of our videos on, um, on ActiFeed, but any time that you change material thicknesses, you should be playing with ActiFeed. And if you're not, um, you're, you're definitely uh, affecting um, the sew quality that your machine is able to give you um, and the amount of thread breaks that you encounter because of not playing with that active feed. Yeah, you might not be getting bad uh, sew outs. Um, you might be getting okay sew outs. You might be getting through them with a thread break or two. Um, but learning how to feed a little bit more thread when you need it, giving your thread a little bit more loft on the fabric, um, it can improve your sew outs, it can improve the look of your embroidery, and it can alleviate some, some thread break frustration. So yeah, like, like Mike said, um, check out the manual, see what it says, check out the videos that we've done on it. Um, I'm trying to think of the ones that we've done on Facebook and I know we did one on doing thicker materials and that talked about some of that as well. Um, so yeah, don't, don't be afraid to go in and, and give it a little bit more or give it a little bit less depending on what you're sewing. Cool. And maybe if we haven't covered that in a video, maybe that's a good topic yeah, I, to I, come up with I agree. It. We it's we'll something that we research that. should have or should cover. We've, we're getting to a point where we have so many videos now that we're starting to uh, to lose track. We're going to have to celebrate when we get to our 100th video. Um, so real quick, no more questions at this point. If you still have questions, um, feel free to post them. Um, we will get back to this. We will. Uh, Nate will post this video up onto YouTube. If you're not uh, subscribed to our YouTube channel, definitely do that because it's a little bit easier to do searches. Um, Melco Service has a wonderful uh, FAQ. So if you go to Melco, melco-service.com um, and on the left side, you'll see an FAQ. Click on that. You can type in a search like ActiFeed and it'll give you a whole bunch of really good information uh, that Dan and, uh, and our service team has put together. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, we always mention this, there's a great uh, Facebook users group out there that is independent of us. Yeah. But, you know, I, I learn something every week from that group. Um, I so that's get on there more often. You, you should. Uh, For the Love of Melco Embroidery Machines is a great Facebook uh, resource. Um, so, yeah, we're going to wrap this up. But one more thing, I just want to remind you, uh, tune in to Melco's YouTube channel at 11 o'clock Mountain Time. So you're 17 minutes out. Yep, 17 minutes to the premiere of the video. I think it's a pretty cool video. I'm pretty excited and pretty proud um, to be a part of Melco. And, and this video, I think, uh, just I think shows. they did a really, really nice job. Yeah, they did. They did a really good job. Um, tune in Friday uh, for Design Shop uh, Talk Questions. Um, Sam, uh, Samantha Maribal will be uh, hosting us this week. And then we'll have Sue Gorton. Uh, the next two weeks after that. Um, That's fun. Yeah, wonderful ladies that have a, just a wealth of knowledge. Scott uh, kind of co-hosts it with them. Um, so, you know, we got the best of the best uh, answering questions. And I think... I think one of us has to get back behind that computer now. Yeah, one of us has to <laughs> shut this Let thing down or, or we're just going to keep going. But, um, yeah, tune in next week for Facebook Live. Chris Fenton will be going over uh, how to clear bird's nests without damaging the machines. Um, and post some comments of great suggestions of, hey, I would love you guys to do a video on this. So thank you again for being a Melco customer. Um, from the bottom of our hearts here at Melco, um, we appreciate you guys. And uh, have a great day and so on. Thank you so much.